everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's been a minute. A minute. A minute being like July 2021 was my last video. It was a long one. A long time ago. But you guys, you remember what it was like back then <laughs> and since then. Anyway, if this is your first time on my channel, welcome. My name is Avon Van Hassel. I am the author of The Bean Seller Saga which is available on Amazon for Kindle and paperback. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I am technically on Twitter, but who would be there these days? Anyway, here on YouTube, I used to pop in every week to give tips and tricks on things to try in your writing, but lately I've, I was depressed for a long time, y'all. That's just really what it is. And even then, I kind of I kind of hit a skid. So really, I'd like to get back to that eventually, ideally. But at the moment, we're just going to see where it goes and just see if I can get on a semi-regular posting schedule. I didn't make a video in January because I was doing, quite frankly, everything else in January. I was doing a lot of groundwork and just just setting up a lot of things, just getting, just got a lot of different balls rolling. So I didn't really have the time or honestly the energy to do a video. And it was one word anyway, my one word update. And really what, what more can you say about it? Every once in a while, when I'm not giving tips and tricks, I like to tell a historical story or just talk about something else. My most popular video to date is a video I made about the love letters that Napoleon Bonaparte sent to his wife, Empress Josephine. And that was hard to read. That was, and it was a lot of fun. It was, it was fun hard. It was like difficult, but in a really amusing way. So today I'm going to continue that tradition and hopefully make a thing of it. I haven't really, I don't really know of that many, like, super awkward, cringy love letters between well-known people in the past, but if you guys know of any, please do let me know because I had a lot of fun with this. So, this year, if there's any, co <laughs> any cohesion to this monologue at all, welcome to my channel, welcome back. I'm happy to be back, and I hope that I can keep it going, and today we're going to talk about more historical love letters that are low-key kind of hard to read. So lately, on the internet, people have discovered that Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville were friends. And when I first heard about that, that just felt like... <laughs> it just felt like a historical OTP fanfiction, you know what I mean? It's just like, oh yeah, sure, and Jane Austen and Shakespeare were meeting up every Saturday for putt-putt golf or whatever. It just felt like you just throw a couple of American authors together and it didn't even occur to me that they were contemporaries, which of course they were. And of course, this is a true story. This happened, by the way. They really did know each other and they were quite close. But it just, it just has that feeling. It's just kind of, it feels unreal, right? These two big names in American literature, the idea that they would have actually been running around together is just kind of wild. And the funny thing is, it actually gets wilder after that, but there are some other big names that are going to be popping up here. So just as a little disclaimer, just not really a disclaimer, just something I want to touch on. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine a little while ago, and I feel like even today, things are getting better in 2023 for uh, people in the LGBTQ community, but there is still a tendency to speculate on those relationships and treat them sort of as like a punchline. Like, wouldn't it be funny if these two were gay, right? And while we, we do like to speculate on the nature of people's personal lives, I do think it is a little bit inappropriate to make those sorts of assumptions. Not, not whether or not they were gay. Obviously, people come in all shapes and sizes and creeds and whatevers, and they're all valid. But I just don't like, I just don't like a lot of the discussions around this being like, playing it off like a punchline. And that makes me uncomfortable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the facts as they are and let you draw your own conclusions. They certainly, demonstrably, had a very tight relationship. And whether it was romantic or sexual is not for me to say, but it was definitely very close. And the things that this man 
put into writing are what got him here. So the nature of their relationship isn't necessarily the funny part. It's the things that he thought were a good idea to think, first of all, say out loud, but then actually put paper, put pen to paper about. And that's what we're getting into. This one isn't going to be quite as spicy as Napoleon because Napoleon is like his own league of gross, the way he talks. But this story in a lot of ways is wilder. Just the context, all the things happening around these letters is is just unbelievable <laughs> in a lot of ways. It's just the lives these men had and that the the actual the meeting of these two superpowers is not the most remarkable part of their lives is just crazy so to start off with if you came up through the american school system chances are you've heard of both of these men nathaniel hawthorne is best known for writing a book called the scarlet letter which you know if you remember hester prynne and she had the a emblazoned on her dress because she was an adulteress and she had a child and she wasn't married and all of that. He did a lot of stuff relating to the Puritans and um, the colonial period of the states before the major colonies, like, um, well, before the revolution, essentially. So very early on, the early, early uh, colonial days of the, what is now New England. And then Herman Melville you'll know as the author of Moby Dick. He also wrote another, a bunch of, they both, they both wrote a ton of stuff. But Melville, actually, I read another of his pieces recently, and it was fascinating. The story itself was fine, but it was more the history of the piece. And I'm not going to ruin it for you because it was a big deal at the time. I'm... Um, going in a bunch of different directions with it because it's been a long time since I recorded a video and I'm just getting back into it. So I'm going to start off with Nathaniel Hawthorne. As I said, he wrote The Scarlet Letter. He also wrote The House of Seven Gables and he wrote a book called Mosses from an Old Manse. Now, Mosses from an Old Manse, I hadn't heard of Manse with S-E, M-A-N-S-E, Manse, as in like a shortened version of Mansion. And I hadn't heard of that story or collection of short stories before I started doing the research for this subject. And because it's, it's one of his more well-known pieces, but I wouldn't say it's one of his more popular pieces. It's very, it's less timeless than other pieces. And it was very like personal at the time. I'm going to get into it. He was born in 1804 in Salem, which is significant because if you remember your history, you'll remember that he had a an ancestor who was actually a judge during the Salem witch trials. And he was very, he felt a lot of guilt about that. And he was very embarrassed about it, actually. But he was still, he had a pride about the family being tied to that period of history and being involved in a significant event in history. But he felt a lot of guilt about, you know, all the death and the persecution and the far reaching implications that that event had and all the fallout from it in subsequent years. And also I feel like he would have been really grossed out by like the glorification of that whole situation. I think the tourist industry in Salem, I don't know what it was like in 1804 and when he was growing up, but today there's quite a lot of tourism. And I think he would have thought that was really gross. His name was originally spelled Hawthorne without the W. He had it legally added in later in his 20s to distance himself from his ancestor and to literally establish his own name, which, considering how well known he is even today, he did a pretty good job, I think. When he was 12, his father got an idea into his head that they needed to return to the land. And so they moved to Maine, where they were, like, living with these other farmers. And they were basically just living off the land. Just kind of, it was a very hand-to-mouth sort of situation. And he remembered this later as being one of the happier times in his life. He and his sisters and his mother were very close. And he had this little, like, 
handwritten newsletter that he would, like, hand out to his friends and families, and it was very, like, I really, like, the more research I've done on Hawthorne, I just really love him so much. He just reminds me so much of myself at that age. When I was in, like, fourth or fifth grade, like, a bunch of my friends and I were really into this, like, Irish girl band. And we did. Like, we printed off newsletters. Like, we were, like, our own little, like, celebrity gossip column. And we would, like, have meetings where we would talk about this. So, it's just catastrophically lame looking back on it now. But at the time, so I just, I really identify with this part of Melville's, with sorry, with Hawthorne's life. At 17, he attended Bowdoin College, where he would meet future President Franklin Pierce. As well as my personal favorite poet, well, American poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So, already off to a star-studded start. Star-studded start. Yeah, I got that right. Ooh, that's harder to say than it sounded like. Anyway. He describes himself as an idle student, preferring to focus on his own curriculum, which, again, is the biggest mood. Y'all, I was the worst student. I was such a bad... Because I was like... It was all boring, man. I just, I was a nerd and I would just like study constantly and incessantly, but just like never what they were telling us in school. Like I didn't care. I didn't care. I wanted to do my own study. In 1828, he started self-publishing his own work, which I also can't knock him for. Uh, and surprisingly, it didn't sell very well, which is some things just don't change, do they? He also served as the editor on the, what's it called, American Magazine of Entertaining and Useful Knowledge. I wish, is that still a thing? Because I feel like if it is, I need to figure out how to get some articles in there because I have entertaining and useless knowledge galore. He also worked for a time in the Boston Custom House and in order to like stay there, he was living in a boarding house that had a whole bunch of like politicians and other writers and it was again there were just a bunch of people staying there with him <laughs> in 1841 he joined a utopian society which if you guys don't know a lot about like the great awakening which is a period of kind of religious it's a religious thing that happened in the states in the like early mid 1800s when like all these new religious groups were popping up, like the Shakers and the Oneida community, and I think that's around the time when the Mormons got started, and just just a bunch of people experimenting with, like, new ways of being Christian and new societies and things, and so there were a lot of communes happening at that time, and a lot of people trying to experiment with a utopian society and trying to get that to work. Well, he fell in love with a girl who was living in a utopian society. Her name was Sophia Peabody. And so he joined the society basically so he could ask her out. And she herself was a transcendentalist illustrator, which again, just the people that this dude was around is just to, to be a fly on the wall of any of the boarding houses he lived in. So a year later they got married and they moved into her family home, I believe, called Old Manse, which you remember I mentioned Old Manse earlier. This was a pretty old house, and one of their neighbors was Emerson. Like, Ralph Waldo Emerson was their neighbor. So he grew up with Franklin Pierce. Well, he went to college with Franklin Pierce and Longfellow, and now he's living next to Emerson, and he married a transcendentalist illustrator who he met at a utopian society. <laughs> These two were deeply and like obsessively in love and they could be like their own love story and in fact there are books about their love story and they had three children which were Una, Julian, and Rose. So Mosses from an Old Manse is a collection of short stories. It's 23 short stories which he had previously published but he kind of it's kind of like an omnibus sort of situation where he took these works that were already kind of known and just published them together in one work. So he, he got some commercial success from Mosses because, like I said, some of these stories were already well known. So he already kind of knew that it was going to sell. And he personally did send a copy to Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> because this dude is just, he's living the life. Anyway, so he sent it to Poe. And Poe, in his customary, 
just, you know, you know, you know what he's like. And then Emerson, being a good neighbor, did read it and also wrote a review where he basically said that Hawthorne is underpaid. So I did a little math in the, um, the blog post that's coming out today. And it looks like he was paid $75 in 1846, which by 2022 money would be, which would be $2,902 and 69 cents. So yeah, I don't really, that wasn't a lot. That's not a lot more than I've ever made, but not a lot. So especially for something that was considered a commercial success. So times have always been tough for us creatives out here. But the reason I brought out Mosses is because Herman Melville also wrote a review and we're going to get to that. So we're going to switch gears and we're going to go talk about Melville. And if you thought Hawthorne's life was crazy, Hawthorne, no, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to do Melville first and then we're going to come back. Hawthorne was born in 1819, so he's 15 years younger, and he was a dish, my guys. If, first of all, all the things I'm going to tell you, this dude was proper swashbuckling and handsome. So, yeah, yeah, hold, 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 please. So, you'll know him as the writer of Moby Dick. He also wrote... Bartleby the Scrivener, which is an investment, but it has a very dedicated fan base. And he also wrote a short story that I referenced before called Benito Sereno. Benito Sereno is... This is also going to have a little bit of a content warning. I should probably put this at the beginning. There's some racism, quite frankly. It, it was the early 1800s, so it's kind of to be expected. We don't care for it, but it's a thing that's unavoidable, unfortunately. So Benito Sereno is an interesting thing, not because of the actual, the story on the surface, which I'm not going to tell you about because it will contain some triggering language, but... So if you're interested in reading it, just, just be aware there's some problematic imagery. It's what he does with the narrative that, as far as I know, is not repeated to any significant degree before Agatha Christie's murder of Roger Ackroyd, which, if you know, you know. So, and that wasn't, that's not the only times that this particular little this particular literary device has occurred. They're just significant. And she was ripped apart at the time for it. And I just think it's interesting that he did it way earlier. And I don't know if he was ripped apart for it. I imagine he probably was. But it's just nice to see this particular literary device out there at such an early period. And I didn't see it coming. I did not see the twist coming at all. And I was living for it. So beware, but also enjoy it. Enjoy the literary device. The content is iffy. So he was born in 1819, as I said, in New York City. And his family was also prestigious. Both of his grandfathers were veterans of the um, Revolutionary War. His paternal... His paternal grandfather... Actually... <laughs> Get your shit together, girl. His paternal grandfather actually participated in the Boston Tea Party, and his maternal grandfather defended Fort Stanwix. So, big deal. Big deal in the family. He was also a bad student. <laughs> this is the thing, you guys. It's okay if you're a bad student. I know it sounds tough right now, but... A lot of geniuses are bad students. So don't give up. You might make a writing career out of this someday and then you still won't make any money, but you'll have a writing career. But like a lot of us, he was also a gifted writer from a young age. However, he did drop out early because his father was very bad at managing money. And at this time, he took a bunch of odd jobs. He was a teacher for a little while. He was a fur trader. I think he worked at a bank for a minute. 
So he just kind of picked up work wherever he could do it. And he just kind of rolled between jobs. And then eventually he got the idea that maybe the sea was calling. So he got a job on a merchant vessel called St. Lawrence. And in 1839, it went from New York to Liverpool in England. So it crossed the Atlantic. After that, it was fine. He briefly returned to teaching, but then he was like, mm, I, went on, I was on a ship and this is boring as fuck. So he decided to return to the sea where he joined a whaling ship. And this is where it all starts. And the whaling ship was called a Kushnet. I have a feeling I'm going to get feedback for that one. And I welcome it. A Kushnet is what we're going with, but that could be any language that is in English. And so any of that. So, so the majority of the books in future that refer to whaling are inspired by this specific experience aboard the Akushnet. <laughs> and this is where it starts to get good. In 1842, he and another crewmate uh, jumped ship and they just basically just walked off. Which you can't do that. You can't, that's, you can't do that. Then they were picked up. They participated in a mutiny. They went to prison in a tropical, I think somewhere in Micronesia. And then they broke out. And then they got picked up by, I think, an Australian ship. It was, it was a ship, either it was Australian or ended up in Australia. One of those. And he, <laughs> and then he joined the U.S. Navy and then he was discharged <laughs> in October of like 1843. So remember the start in 1842 when he joined the Akushnet and then he jumped ship, got caught, was in a mutiny, went to prison, got out, boarded another ship, then joined the U.S. Navy and then was discharged. <laughs> in like a year and a half. <laughs> That's a lot. So understandably from all of this, he developed kind of this mistrust of authority and he just had this kind of real like rebel sense about him. And he just, he had this need for freedom and he had this deep, deep, deep self-confidence. And it, he was just, he was just your proper adventure man. And that's just very cool of him, I think. So in 1845, he published a book called Type E. I think that's how it's pronounced. T-Y-P-E-E. -E. And it was inspired by that year and a half of freedom and adventure that he had. And he had jump ship on an island called Nukuhiva, I think. Again, correct me if I'm mispronouncing that, but N-U-K-U, second word, H-I-V-A. And this book, first of all, this book is a big one in his... Um, bibliography because it is it's his first published novel and it also has the distinction of drawing the attention of one Nathaniel Hawthorne. In 1847 Melville married Elizabeth Knapp Shaw who he'd only known for a few months and in 1849 they had their first child Malcolm and this is where the story kind of comes together. In August of 1850, the two would cross paths at a picnic in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And yes, there were a ton of famous people at this picnic as well. Because these guys just travel, in the, well, first of all, Hawthorne travels in these circles of movers and shakers and politicians and naval officers and poets and writers and illustrators and religious zealots with their big tents and they just, what a fascinating life. And then Melville was, as I recall, he was dragged along by a friend. He was like, this other buddy was going to this picnic and he was like, do you want to come? And he was like, Ugh. and they were like, well, come and have a good time anyway. And then they met. And apparently they kind of went off together at one point and they had a deep conversation. And that was it. And I got to tell you, that has happened to me a few times in my life where you're just like, you're pulled aside by some rando and somebody says something and you're off to the races and then, you know, you just, just, there's never a day when you don't hear from them. And that's fantastic. That's the best. 
So Melville recognized Hawthorne because he'd been given a copy of Mosses from an Old Manse, but he hadn't read it yet. But after meeting Hawthorne, he decided to read the book and was surprised. He published an anonymous review titled Hawthorne and His Mosses, which is bad. But he heaped on it purple praise, and it was, it's cringy. Just the thing itself is cringy. And what's funny is that Hawthorne had also written a review of Type E, but I can't find a date for that review, so I don't know if it happened before Melville's review of Mosses or not. So, anyway, they reviewed each other's works like good friends do. Good friends review each other's work. They give five stars on Amazon. And this review, you guys, I kid you not, is an essay. It's not just like a couple of lines about what he liked and what all that. It's it's an essay. And at one point, he refer refers to Hawthorne's blackness, meaning the blackness of his, the depth of his feeling, or seldom seen dark side. So it's, it's referring to his, his darkness, his shadow side, which so fixes and fascinates me. He, he also openly compares him to Shakespeare. Like, he just references Shakespeare all over the place, which is... It's a bit much. It's a bit much. I mean, I would welcome it if anybody wanted to compare my work to Shakespeare. However, I wrote that shit, and I know y'all be lying. However, if you did want to write me an essay of a review, I'd, I'd write you a love letter. I can be purple. Hawthorne, in response writes a review of Type E where he just praises he praises Melville's youth and vigor. You know how bros talk about each other. It's just so much. He talks about like the vibrancy and the sumptuousness of the setting details, but the delicacy of the narrative and it's just in fairness, apparently Type E was while it does deal with indigenous people of, I believe, the um, South Pacific, it apparently is considered for the time to be a very respectful and almost anthropological endeavor. It seems to be, obviously we can't judge people in the past by modern standards, that old song, but it is, you know, we had to start somewhere, right? And it does seem as though he did go out of his way to depict these people and their culture in a more or less objective and, and respectful way. He didn't, from what I understand, I haven't read it, but he didn't depict them in the way that, you know, we would expect of a cultural caricature and, you know, those overblown, the other overblown otherness of people in certain parts of the world who differ from the U.S. and Europe in whiteness, honestly. And actually Hawthorne recognizes in his review that he thinks the reason why it didn't meet with more success is because American and European audiences weren't prepared for such a sympathetic portrayal of these non-white people. And so he thinks that were they more culturally sensitive, that it would have done better. And so it wasn't a harsh enough critique of the people of Nukuhiva for European and American audiences. So they started writing back and forth to each other in the 1850s. And it was a bunch and a lot, a bunch and a lot. And both of those mean different things. And they visited a lot with and without their families and they would go on adventures together and then they would write about their adventures back and forth when they got home. They only hung out for about 14 years, from about 1850 to about 1864. And then things started to kind of, you know, sometimes you drift apart from your friends and it's very sad, but it just kind of, it just kind of faded as these things do. But you can't really dispute the intensity. And in fact, the dedication, I don't know if you guys noticed this, or if you remember, or if you even, 
if you haven't read Moby Dick, I'm not going to judge you for it because woof. But Moby Dick is dedicated to Nathaniel Hawthorne. So something to be said for that, I think. And in fact, some scholars have speculated that the white whale represents Melville's obsession with Hawthorne. I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just saying. People can be obsessed with all kinds of things, and just because it might have been inspired by a specific person doesn't mean that it's not still a universal concept that we can all understand. Because I think I for sure have a number of white whales in my life. Not necessarily people. Some of them are people, but not all of them are people. And, um... You know, the white whale can be a metaphor for all kinds of things that you obsess over until it destroys you. So, which now I think of that, I don't think Hawthorne destroyed Melville, but I have, when I was doing the research for this, you'd be amazed how many people were out there being like, I think Hawthorne ruined Melville's writing. Like, they're like, you can really tell when they hung out together because the quality of his writing just fell right off. So maybe, maybe, I don't know. So one of my favorite things to do is to speculate the nature. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to speculate the nature of the relationship and I'm not going to, I'm not going to speculate whether or not they were romantic or sexually involved. I just, I just like to imagine the two of them just like vibing. You know what I mean? So you have to imagine Hawthorne is such a, he's such an ivory tower fairy tale princess with his, his idyllic childhood and and his tragic history, like tragic family curse, literally a witch's curse, I'm sure. And he grew up with all these luminaries and he lived in a utopian commune for a minute where he met the love of his life, who he was obsessed with, and they had ch three children with mythical names. And he wrote stories about witches and guilt and this house that he loved and he was... He's just such a little dreamlike fairy person, right? And then you have the swashbuckling Melville who had, you know, his he had his military family. So he had a lot of like action men in his background. And then he had his father who frittered away the family wealth. And so he had all these odd jobs, but he still had a poet's heart. And then, you know, the teaching job didn't pay him. So he went to sea and... He ended up on this island and he was in a mutiny in prison <laughs> and then he decided to write and he wrote this anthropological story that was actually like not shitty about the indigenous people and people didn't like it because he was too even handed, I guess, about being racist. <laughs> and then, then the two of them, so you can see and, and Melville is 15 years younger than Hawthorne, but he describes Melville as being, sorry, he describes Melville is 15 years younger than Hawthorne, but he describes Hawthorne as being this, like, beautiful, elegant man, and it just... <sighs> it's it's very yin-yang, isn't it? They're very, very different, but they still have so much in common, because they're both so expressive and emotional, and one thing that's really fabulous is I have this book of the letters, because, you know, I gotta have the book of the letters. But it's just Melville's letters, which I think actually says, you know, I love to have the other side. I didn't get to read Josephine's letters and I was bummed about that. And this is, I don't get to read uh, Hawthorne's letters to Melville. And you have to wonder why, because not much is really said about Melville's relationship with his wife. And I'm not, I'm not saying that has anything to do with the relationship with Hawthorne, but you have to wonder why Hawthorne, his side of the, the letters he received survived and the letters that Melville, Melville received didn't. And I don't know what that, I think it says the Hawthorne is romantic for one thing. And he held on to the letters because 
They were important to him. But I can't imagine Melville throwing away Hawthorne's letters. So, kind of wonder what happened to them. Why, why they weren't preserved. So, I just love the idea that Hawthorne kept them, though. That's just so sweet. He's such a sweetheart. And then in 1864, Hawthorne sadly passed away. And they, they'd they kind of more or less fallen out by this point. Well, not fallen out. They, they didn't, like, break up. They just kind of, they didn't have as much correspondence at that point. And there, there is evidence that Melville was distraught, or at least very, very sad at the passing of Hawthorne. So I feel like even though they didn't correspond as much, I think they probably still held the same amount of importance in each other's lives um, at the time of Hawthorne's passing. So I promised you guys letters, and I have letters. So I have this book. The Divine Magnet, Herman Melville's Letters to Nathaniel Hawthorne, edited by Mark Niermeyer. And so we're going to jump into some of those. I did publish, well, I say publish, I did make some excerpts that I put in the blog post for you guys to, you know, share around if it's fun. So the very first letter, which is in 1851, this is January 29th of 1851. It's in Pittsfield, and apparently it's a Wednesday. And Melville writes, That side blow through Mrs. Hawthorne will not do. I am not to be charmed out of my promised pleasure by any of that lady's serenisms. You, italicized, you, sir, I hold accountable, and the visit, in all its original integrity, must be made. What? Spend the day? Italicized. Only with us? A Greenlander might as well talk of spending the day with a friend when the day is only half an inch long. Half an inch day. We, we measure time in inches now. As I said before, my best traveling chariot on runners will be at your door and provisions made not only for the accommodation of all your family, but also for any quantity of baggage. Baggage is also italicized. They were just, you know, people make fun of people in, like, the before times in, like, the 1600s, 1700s, where they were just capitalized random things. I don't know what the convention is for italicization for the Victorians. I just, no idea. It's just anything. <laughs> Fear not that you will cause the slightest trouble to us. Your bed is already made and the wood marked for your fire. But a moment ago I looked into the eyes of two fowls whose tail feathers have been notched as destined victims for the table. Um, I looked into their eyes and thought, yes, you too. I will murder you tonight. <laughs> Another thing, Mr. Hawthorne, do not think you are coming to any prim, nonsensical house, as if Herman Melville could be prim and nonsensical. That is nonsensical in the ordinary way. You won't be much bored with punctilios. You may, be, you may do what you please. Say or say not what you please. And if you feel any inclination for that sort of thing, you may spend the period of your visit in bed italicized, if you like, every hour of your visit. The whole time. Hark, there is some excellent Montando sherry waiting for you, and the most potent port. We love a potent port, don't we, Mr. Sailor Man? We will have mulled wine with wisdom, and buttered toast with storytelling, and crack jokes and bottles from morning till night. Come, no nonsense. If you don't, I will send constables after you. On Wednesday, italicized, then, weather and slang permitting, I will be down for you at 11 o'clock a.m. By the way, should Mrs. Hawthorne for any reason conclude that she, for one, cannot stay overnight with us, then you must, the children, and the children, if you please. I mean, did he not twice call Mrs. Hawthorne a harpy? Did he not... Am I reading into that? There's italicization in here. In a day, in the days before, you could just italicize your font. So he wrote it slanted. Like, that's a level of pettiness that just... I'm not the only one seeing this, right? I see, you see it. You see it, right? You see the petty. Now, here's the sort of... In case you guys are wondering how to leave a review, this is literally the next paragraph of this letter from April 16th, 1851, also a Wednesday. The House of Seven Gables, a romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne, one volume 16, what, this is not important. 
The contents of this book do not belie its rich, clustering romantic title. With great enjoyment, we spent almost an hour in each separate gable. This book is like fine old chamber, abundantly, but still judiciously, furnished with precisely that sort of furniture best fitting to furnish it. There are rich hangings wherein are braided scenes from tragedies. There is old china with rare devices set on the carved buffet. There are long and indolent lounges to throw yourself upon. There is an admirable sideboard plentifully stored with food vian, and there is a smell of old wine in the pantry, and finally, in one corner, there is a dark little black letter volume in golden clasps entitled Hawthorne, A Problem. It has delighted us. It has piqued a reperusal. It has robbed of us a day. It has robbed us of a day, and made us a present of a whole year of thoughtfulness. It has bred great exhilaration and exultation with the remembrance that the architect of the gables resides only six miles off, and not three thousand miles away in England. Say, this goes on for some length. This is all the same paragraph, you guys. And it it. Uh, and he just goes on and on and on and on. And there's even a PS. <laughs> and footnotes. My dear Hawthorne, now we're in early May 1851. I should have been rumbling down to you my pine board chariot a long time ago, were it not that in some weeks past I have been more busy than you can well imagine out of doors. Building and patching and tinkering away in all directions. Besides, I had my crops to get in, corn and potatoes, blah, 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 blah and many other things to attend to, all accumulating upon this one particular season. I work myself, and at night my bodily sensations <laughs> are akin to those I have so often felt before when a hired man doing my day's work from sun to sun. But I mean to continue visiting you until you tell me that my visits are both supererogatory and superfluous. I would never want to be accused of being supererogatory or superfluous. Do tell me if I become supererogatory dollars damn me mood what i feel most moved to write that is banned it will not pay yet altogether write the other way i cannot so the product is a final hash and all my books are botches <sighs> i talk all about myself and this is selfishness and egotism granted period full sentence but how help it? I am writing to you. I know little about you, but something about myself. So I write about myself, at least to you. Don't trouble yourself, though, about writing. And don't trouble yourself about visiting. And when you do visit, don't trouble yourself about talking. I will do all the writing and visiting and talking myself. <laughs> Ooh. I like Melville. I do. And then he talks about himself a bit more, which... Dum, dum, dum. So in July of 1851, I've skipped like two letters, by the way, because they, they were talking about writing, which if you're not a writer, shit's boring. I loved it, but you might be bored. So this one says, my dear Hawthorne, this one's a Tuesday. Nice. This is not a letter or even a note, but only a passing word sent to you over your garden gate. I thank you for your easy flowing long letter received yesterday, which flowed through me, flowed, it's flowing and it flowed through me, and refreshed all my meadows. I am now busy with various things, not incessantly though, but enough to require my frequent tinkerings, and this is the height of the haying season, and my nag is dragging me home his winter's dinners all the time. And so, one way or another, I am not yet disengaged, man, but shall be very soon. Meantime, the earliest good chance I get, I shall roll to you. My dear fellow being, we, that is, you and I, must hit upon some little bit of vagabondism before autumn comes. I love a bit of vagabondism myself. Greylock, we must go and vagabondize there. Does this remind you of, um... Oh, what is it? From The Importance of Being Earnest? Oh, what's his name? Bunbraying. That's what it is. When, when, what's, when Algernon is away, he's bunbraying. He's always looking after his friend Bunbury. So vagabonding. Vag vagabondizing. But ere we start, we must dig a deep hole and bury all blue devils, there to abide till the last day. Goodbye. His X mark. It literally says his X mark. So I don't know if that means like he literally just X'd it and then like the editor is writing like, oh, he X'd it. Or if he literally said his X mark. <sighs> 
So this next one, I have to, I can't start at the beginning because it's, he's not talking about anything interesting, but 17th November, 1851, a Monday now, says, Whence come you, Hawthorne? By what right do you drink from my flagon of life? And when I put it to my lips, lo, they are yours and not mine. I feel that the Godhead is broken up like the bread at the supper, and that we are the pieces, hence this infinite fraternity of feeling. No commentary on that one. My dear Hawthorne, the atmospheric skepticism steal into me now and make me doubtful of my sanity in writing you thus. But believe me, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But truth is ever incoherent, and when the big hearts strike together, the concussion is a little stunning. It certainly is. Farewell. Don't write a word. Oh, don't write a word about the book. That would be robbing me of my miserly delight. I am heartily sorry I ever wrote anything about you. It was paltry. Lord, when shall we be done growing? <sighs> Felt that one. As long as we have anything more to do, we have done nothing. So now let us add Moby Dick to our blessing and step from that. Leviathan is not the biggest fish I have heard of Krakens. <laughs> this is a long letter, he says. He literally said, this is a long letter. But you are not at all bound to answer it. Oh my god, Melville is me. I do that all the time. Like, I'll write to somebody and be like, Oof, that was a long one, sorry. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Possibly if you do answer it and direct it to Herman Melville, you will missend it, for the very fingers that now guide this pen are not precisely the same that just took it up and put it on the paper. <laughs> ah, he literally said, I have changed. I have aged since I started writing this. <laughs> oh lord, when shall we be done changing? <laughs> I love the way this man writes. Ah, it's a long stage and no inn in sight and night coming in the body cold. But with you for a passenger, I am content and can be happy. I shall leave the world, I feel, with more satisfaction for having come to know you. Knowing you persuades me more than the Bible of our immortality. What a pity that for your plain bluff letter you should get such gibberish. You wrote me a sensible thing. It was just a regular letter and I was like... Very me. Mention me to Mrs. Hawthorne and to the children, and so goodbye to you with my blessing. Herman. I can't stop yet. <laughs> if the world was entirely made up of magens, I can tell you what I should do. I should have a paper mill established at one end of the house, so to have an endless ribbon to fool scap, rolling in upon my desk and upon that endless ribbon. I should write a thousand, a million, billion thoughts, all under the form of a letter to you. The divine magnet, hey, title, is in you in my magnet response. Lord. He said that. Which is the biggest? Whew. A full question. They are one. One capitalized and italicized. H, period. Don't think that by writing me a letter, you shall always be bored with an immediate reply to it. And so keep both of us delving over a written desk, a writing desk eternally. No such thing. I shan't always answer your letters and you may do just as you please. <sighs> oh, you guys. See, this whole time I was like, I gotta find me a Melville because he's got that, he's got that thing. But now the more I think about it, I think I am Melville and I'm looking for a Hawthorne. Which, I wouldn't hate that. I'm just saying. So sensitive, you know. Makes you want to write a lot. <laughs> okay, one more, and then I really gotta go. I can't be here all day reading all these letters. This is a sweet one. This is from July of 1852. So this is a little while later. By the way, here's a crown. Significant this. Pray, allow me to place it on your head in victorious token of your Blythedale success. Aye. Though not in strict keeping, I have embellished it with a plume. <laughs> That's cute. My dear Hawthorne. So that wasn't actually like the beginning of the letter. That was like before the beginning of the letter. He's, he's a wild letter writer, you guys. Just no respect for the form. My dear Hawthorne, this name of Hawthorne seems to be ubiquitous. I have been on something of a tour lately, and it has saluted me vocally and typographically in all sorts of places and in all sorts of ways. I was at the solitary Crossoish. I was at the solitary Crossoish Island of Nowshot. Oh man, 
That's got to be a New England thing, right? I have no idea how to pronounce any of that. And there, on a stately piazza, I saw it gilded on the back of a very new book and in the hands of a clergyman. I went to visit a gentleman in Brookline. I hope it's Brookline and not Brooklyn. And as we were sitting at our wine, in came the lady of the house, holding a beaming volume in her hand from the city. My dear, to her husband, I have brought you Hawthorne's new book. I entered the cars at Boston for this place. In came a lively boy, Hawthorne's new book. In good time I arrived home, said my lady wife, there is Mr. Hawthorne's new book, come by mail. And this morning, lo, on my table a little note, in subscribed Hawthorne again. Well, the Hawthorne is a sweet flower. May it flourish in every hedge. Well, the Avon is a river, so may it flow, I guess. Anyway. I am sorry, but I cannot at present come to see you at Concord as you propose. I am but just returned from a two weeks absence, and for the last three months and more I have been an utter idler and a savage, out of doors all the time, so the hour has come for me to sit down again. That's, honestly, that's a mood. Do send me a specimen of your sand hill, and a sunbeam from the countenance of Mrs. Hawthorne. Oh, we like her now, do we? And a vine from the curly arbor of Master Julian. That's so cute. <laughs> And as I am only just home, I have not yet got far into the book, but enough to see that you have most admirably employed materials which are richer than I had fancied them. Especially at this day, the volume is welcome, as an antidote to the mooniness of some dreamers, who are merely dreamers. Yet, who the devil ain't. <laughs> yeah, who the devil ain't a dreamer. His words, not mine. H. Melville. My remembrances to Miss Una and Master Julian, and the compliments and perfumes of the season, to the rosebud. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, that's so cute. Okay. That's all I'm going to do right now, you guys. Don't forget, there are some little, like, Instagram already reformatted thingies in the blog post. So, I hope you guys have had some fun with my newest history crushes. Did not think I would have crushes on either of them, but I kind of do. And so now I might have to read more of their books because I've already, I'm already familiar but now I have to go hang out with my boyfriends a little bit. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, don't forget to do all the YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, comment. Uh, drag me for my pronunciations. You know you know the drill. And um, by the way, just a note on the Napoleon video. I didn't know who Hortense was. And uh, somebody in the comments told me that Hortense was Josephine's daughter from her previous relationship. Because she's been married before she married Napoleon. So got that cleared up um which is why he re referred to her as a delightful child or whatever and i thought it was creepy at the time and now it makes sense because she's literally a kid so that's fine anyway like subscribe follow little bell wherever that is comments also have you read benito sereno because i need to talk about it with somebody it's not that long if you haven't read it go read it unless the discussion of the slave trade is going to be a problem for you if that's going to be not something you want to deal with then definitely give it a miss but otherwise I need to talk about it with somebody also if you read the murder of Roger Ackroyd or really any Poirot I also need to talk about that with somebody not the topic of today's discussion but did you read Scarlet Letter did you read House of Seven Gables or Moby Dick or Bartleby the Scrivener have you read any of it? Have you read any of these? And what did you think? Okay. And does knowing a little bit about their histories make them a little bit different for you? Let me know. I'd love to hear it. Also find me on Facebook and Instagram and, uh, yeah, go do that. And I will see you guys hopefully April, maybe next month, but pro probably April. Let's be honest. All right. All right. Love you. Bye.